For real, bro. I'm from the project, bro. I'm from the project, bro. I wasn't supposed to be here, dog. You know what I'm saying? I sacrificed, dog. For real, bro. I sacrificed, dog. I wasn't supposed to be here, bro. For real. And they say, boy, you will never be shit. All the songs that you make never turn into a hit. No cap, you go platinum. I won't buy your shit. All haters do me a favor. May lay bananas and split. And they say, shit, you will never be shit. Dyson Octave was born June 11, 1997 in Pompano Beach, Florida. He was raised by his mother in a public housing project named Golden Acres. Residents of Golden Acres have stated, you don't really see a clear path to prosperity there. You're probably going to stay in Golden Acres forever. With four older siblings, money tight, food scarce, and his father not around, he says he never really got a chance to be a kid. At a young age, he says the only opportunity he saw for when he grew up was selling drugs with a gun on his hip or rapping. But when he was just in elementary school, he was introduced to his first low-budget studio, which also happened to be in the back of a local trap house. He was invited over after the older guys heard him rap. Being inspired by one of his favorite rappers, Lil Boozy, Dyson had ambitions of writing his own raps. He started reading dictionaries and thesauruses to broaden his vocabulary, but was never too fond of school. He started going to the trap every day after school and rapping on their microphone. At the time he was just a kid and wasn't selling drugs like some of the older guys in there, but he was watching their every move and inevitably started to look up to them and how they kept themselves up. In the fifth grade he was expelled from his school for frequent fighting with other kids. Unfortunately, this would only be the start of his now long list of troubles. As a child, he was known by his nickname Black, or Lil Black, and people from his neighborhood said he used to walk around with a notepad writing rhymes as long as they can remember. In middle school, Dyson faced his first serious juvenile charge. Although it's unclear what he might have been charged with due to Florida's sunshine laws, what we do know is this wasn't enough to scare Dyson out of the streets, and he would spend much of his early teen years in and out of juvenile detention centers. At the time, this was the only life he knew how to live. In his eyes, he was just surviving, doing what he needed to do. I was expecting that shit to happen like one day. Can't keep getting away like this all the time. This is around the time he was meeting other kids like himself, such as Pierre, who we know as Jack Boy. The two became friends around 11 years old and were surprised when they found out their mindsets were similar. They were down for anything, unlike the other kids their age. Whether it was home break-ins or car thefts, it didn't matter. But Dyson would often tell Pierre they should save some of the money they would come up on or reinvest it to jumpstart their rap careers. At 12 years old, he joined a rap group called Brutal Youngins and started taking rap more seriously under his stage name, Jay Black. He was starting to get noticed for his thoughtful and gritty lyrics that for the most part were unheard of by someone so young, and could only be told from someone who was truly experiencing that lifestyle. He was wise beyond his years and was known to light up a room with his presence. Despite his raw talent and potential, he was still getting into trouble in the streets for multiple charges, until catching his first punishable by life charge at age 15. This was a serious charge and could potentially put him behind bars for a very long time if convicted. Luckily enough, his undeniable talent for rapping had already been catching the attention of important people. One of these people was AD, who was the CEO of Dollars and Deals Entertainment. When AD heard what was happening, he reached out and offered to pay for new lawyers to represent him. AD saw superstar status in him and took the opportunity to also pitch the idea of signing him to his label. With his new lawyers by his side, he got off with three years probation and a new record deal with Dollars and Deals. Realizing the opportunity in front of him, he decided to take his music more seriously and change his name from J Black to Kodak Black, which he and his crew felt was more fitting. As his music experience progressed, he became more affiliated with other South Florida artists like the Kalyans and started collabing with them. On December 26, 2013, he dropped his first official mixtape, Project Baby. The mixtape had an overwhelming response from the streets and was bringing nationwide exposure to Kodak and Dollars and Deals. At just 16 years old, Kodak was looking to be the most promising underground artist out of Florida to watch. Through 2014, Kodak continued to record new music but held off on releasing it until they felt it was the right time. But in August of 2014, he dropped a music video to his new single, No Flockin'. The song was showing signs of being his biggest release to date, with a few thousand plays, but it wouldn't initially go viral. He ended 2014 dropping his second mixtape, The Heart of the Projects, and steadily building a fan base. By the way though, I was 16 when I did that No Flocking. The trouble really follow you when you're trying to move forward, go straight, go the right way. Although he had been signed to a label and his music was seemingly getting better with every new project, Kodak was still having a hard time leaving his street life behind. Music came easy to Kodak, and with his career slowly on the rise, it seemed like trouble was the biggest issue he had. He admits to still being in the streets during this time, despite already being booked for shows and making a little money off of rap. 
In 2015, Kodak was arrested multiple times for petty crimes such as marijuana, but also serious allegations like robbery. But while his legal problems were on the rise, his worth ethic was unchanged, and in October of 2015, he dropped another single titled Skirt. According to Google Trends, this song can be directly tied with jumpstarting Kodak's career, and gaining him cosigns from other major artists like Drake, who were seen bumping the song. With Skirt beginning to circulate, it also brought more attention to his older releases, such as his mixtapes and of course, No Flockin which would begin to trend upward over a year after its release. With all eyes on Kodak, he landed his second record deal through Atlantic, and ended 2015 with his third mixtape, Institution. 2016 was a crossroad in Kodak's life. He ended up in back-to-back -back arrests once again, and they would also uncover old warrants from years prior, as well as other allegations against him from other states while he was on tour. This was enough to put him behind bars shortly after his iconic 2016 XXL cipher. It was a scary situation, and Kodak was facing 50 plus years for some of his charges. His career was growing fast this year, but if he was convicted, none of it would have mattered. He spent all of summer 16 locked up and an additional four months later in the year, but he still managed to drop his fourth mixtape, Lil Big Pac, which was his first tape to feature other mainstream artists like Gucci Mane and his favorite rapper growing up, Boozy Badass. Into 2017, Kodak continued to record new music for his upcoming debut album, as well as dropping snippets on Instagram that brought massive amounts of hype to the tape. In early 2017, Kodak dropped his first single from his album, Tunnel Vision, and for the first time ever, he had a top 10 charting song. The song received 25 million plays on YouTube within just two weeks. Kodak had a point to prove to anyone who might have still been sleeping on him, and he proved it. His first album, Painting Pictures, dropped shortly after on March 31st, followed by Project Baby 2 in August. For the first time in a while, it seemed like he was doing a good job of keeping out of trouble, and five of his songs would go multi-platinum this year, and he was looking to be unstoppable. Unfortunately, in early 2018, Kodak found himself once again behind bars for marijuana and possession of a firearm. This would put him away for over seven months until being released in August of 2018, to where he immediately got to work on his second album, Dying to Live. The lead single, ZZ, as well as the album itself would both go number one on the Billboard 100. For someone who had been spending so much time in and out of jail to go number one, showed just how resilient and talented Kodak really was. But it seems like the more successful he got, the bigger the target on his back got as well. In May of 2019, Kodak was on his way to perform at Rolling Loud Festival in Miami. Kodak was once again arrested before his show for lying on paperwork while trying to attain a firearm just months before. Kodak would remain in prison for 18 months facing a potential of 10 years for all his charges. On November 11, 2020, Kodak released his third album, Bill Israel From Behind Bars, but the album would only sell 16,000 copies his first week, which was substantially lower than the numbers he had shown before. While behind bars, it was hard for Kodak to really promote and hype up the tape. His criminal history was finally starting to catch up to him and potentially harm his career in a major way. But on January 19, 2020, Kodak was pardoned by Donald Trump and set free. He immediately got back to work and dropped a new single, Last Day In, which showed signs of a promising comeback. Despite dealing with countless challenges, Kodak has managed to stay one of the most talked about rappers for over half a decade. And he's proved time and time again, if you count him out, he will come back.